Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another Chem Complete lecture. And in today's lecture, I am going to take a look at an extremely important topic throughout all of chemistry and all of biochemistry, and that is an understanding of intermolecular forces. So we are going to cover that in detail coming up on the channel right now. Okay, thank you so much for joining me today and using Chem Complete for all of your learning needs. Let's go ahead and get started with this lecture. So intermolecular forces is an extremely important concept to understand as you are moving forward throughout any type of science-based career, especially if you are in the field of chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, any of those. Intermolecular forces is going to explain a lot of the various physical and chemical phenomenon that we may see uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, for instance, why is one particular compound melting at a higher melting point than the other? Generally, it's the intermolecular forces that may be at play. Now, there's certainly other things that could potentially be present there, uh, but intermolecular forces is one of the driving factors, and we're going to see that here today. So, the way I like to start this lecture off when I am introducing it to students is I first want you to know the difference between intermolecular and intramolecular, okay? because this is helpful in understanding what we're really working with here. Inter means between two. So intermolecular means between two molecules. And if we're talking about intermolecular forces, it are it's the forces that bind or hold these individual molecules in relative proximity to one another. Whereas intramolecular forces means within the same molecule, not between two different molecules. So an intramolecular force would be an example of a bond. Okay, so if you have something like a covalent bond, for instance, that would be an example of an intramolecular force because it is within the molecule. It's electrons within the same molecule that's holding these various atoms together. Okay, and then the intermolecular forces uh, for instance, would be, and we're going to take a look at and define specific examples, right? But let's say that I've got a water molecule in close proximity to another water molecule. And the question is, how do these two water molecules correlate to one another or kind of uh, share some uh, bonding influence with one another? Although it's not a technical bond, right? It's more just of an electrical interaction from the outskirts of the atoms as they get in close proximity to one another. So intermolecular just to remind you is between two molecules so that's the key there when we're looking at that and here it's within the molecule so we're really looking at bonds and other things of that nature and that's the main difference so we are focused on intermolecular forces here today and we're going to see there are four major types of intermolecular forces and the way that I have this list organized we're going to start with the weakest of the bunch which will be van der Waals forces sometimes those are known as London forces or dispersion forces but those are the ones we're really going to take a look at and focus on first they are the weakest of the bunch and then as we move our way up the list they will get more and more uh, powerful in terms of their effect uh, and the intermolecular forces that bind these particular molecules together. So let's start with van der Waals. Okay, so here's the challenge with van der Waals. Um, it's the weakest one, but it is oftentimes, I find, the most difficult one for students to understand or grasp initially when they are working with understanding intermolecular forces for the first time. And that's because um, there's van der Waals forces are always present in all potential molecules. However, uh, the way that it works, you have to understand electron movement and things of that nature, not just dipoles. So when you take a look at van der Waals forces, the best way that I like to give an example here is that you could have two of the same atoms. So let's say that we've got um, a hydrogen, right? And then it's bonded to another hydrogen. That's probably one of the simplest examples there. So we've got H2. Now, what you can take a look at and say is that Generally speaking, 
for this molecule, I would not expect any type of polarity because I do not have a difference in electronegativity when I take a look at that particular uh, bonding setup, right? It's two of the same element. They should be pulling equally on those covalent shared electrons. So I don't expect any type of real intermolecular, um, not intermolecular forces. I don't expect any type of polarity, right? Or dispersion of the electronegativity. But the truth is, this line right here represents a bond. And a bond represents electrons. And students tend to forget this a lot. And electrons are always moving. And that is a very important lesson multiple times throughout multiple courses. But electrons are always moving. They are not these static objects that just sit and link two elements together. They are constantly being shared between those two elements, okay, over kind of a statistical distribution or probability map of where they may be at a given time. And so because they are always moving, what that means is that this is not perfectly split like this at any given time. So you could say that, and this is kind of a crude way of explaining it, but I think that it works the best. You could say that at time A, if I were to evaluate this molecule and look at it at time A, I would find that the electrons are spending more time over on the left hydrogen than they are on the right hydrogen. Now, it probably bothers people to see this, right? If you were to write this on an exam or something like that. But what you need to realize is what I'm saying is at time A. So at one instant, at one moment in time, if I could stop time, one of the two hydrogens has a little bit more electron density than the other. Now, over time, it should even out, right? It should be 50-50. And so overall, we don't expect any type of net polarity or dipole. But at time A, at one specific time, those electrons are still moving back and forth. And so therefore, at time A, I'm going to say it's that. Now, what I can also say is that I'm looking again, and at some time that we call time B, I could see the complete opposite, where now this is the partial positive one, and this is the partial negative one, right? So what happens? Well, what happens is that as this continues, you are inevitably at some point going to come across the following situation in a uh, reaction, a solution, a mixture, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so let's say that I've got partially negative here and I've got partially positive here. And then this is in close proximity to another one that's got partially positive like this. Okay, and then partially negative like this. So what happens at this one moment in time when these two are closely aligned like this. Well, what happens is that I get a very temporary attraction between the negative and the positive ends, and that right there would be considered a van der Waals force. Okay. Now, why are van der Waals forces the weakest? Because I said I'm doing this list and I'm doing it uh, weakest to strongest, so this is the weakest force. What's well, the weakest force because there's no permanency to it? That's why they're also called dispersion forces, because as soon as one of these two flip or there, there's some sort of migration, right, of the uh, electron, and this is no longer really partially negative, maybe this already starts to become partially positive at some time two or time B, and this starts to become partially negative. Well, now at that point, the positive and the positive, those are going to start to repel. So this is going to break apart, right? The force that's temporarily holding that together, those two hydrogen uh, molecules, is going to disperse. And then it's probably going to reform elsewhere in the mixture. So you constantly have this fluctuation when you're talking about van der Waals, where you've got van der Waals forces that are forming, dissipating, forming, dissipating over and over and over. And when you have that situation, it turns out that the larger the molecule is, the more opportunity for van der Waals forces there will be, right? So a lot of people, when they turn around and they take a look at a molecule and they say, oh, look at something like, um, I don't know, propane, right, versus octane. And octane's a liquid at room temperature and propane's a gas. And octane is a liquid because it actually takes more energy to break apart those dispersion forces because octane has m far more hydrocarbons, more opportunities for this to occur over that large surface area, 
Okay, and so you can see that Van der Waals forces, as the size, the physical size of the molecule increases, so do the Van der Waals forces, and then you can end up requiring more energy input for melting points, boiling points, right, things of that nature. So um, I could get into a whole separate side lecture, maybe I will at some point if people are interested in that, on Van der Waals forces and the dissipation effect and surface area and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that is the weakest of the bunch, Van der Waals forces, because, again, I'm going to reiterate, they come and go very rapidly. Now, they're constantly renewing themselves, but because they're coming and going, there is no permanency, there's no lock-on of that force or that attraction uh, for any extended time period. They're the weakest, okay? Now, number two is called dipole-dipole. So this is going to involve some more permanent polarity or separation of electronegativity now that we're moving past the van der Waals. Okay, so with dipole-dipole, we are now going to have something that would contain a more permanent dipole. So instead of hydrogen with another hydrogen, we now want something with some more polarity. So hydrogen, let's say with a chlorine, for instance, would be a good example of this. If I look on the electronegativity uh, trends, hydrogen is going to be less electronegative than the halogens, such as chlorine. And so what I would expect here is that there will be a partial positive charge on the hydrogen and a partial negative charge on that chlorine. But here's the difference between this and the van der Waals. This separation of charge is not going to change. So in other words, I'm not going to suddenly say, well, this is just at time A. And if I look at HCl at time B, all of a sudden there's a probability, uh, or at least a high plausibility, that the chlorine now is partially positive and the hydrogen is partially negative. We wouldn't expect that. This is a temp, um, not temporary, excuse me, this is a permanent dipole. So this is going to stay this way. Okay, so what that means is that if this comes into close proximity to another one in solution, well, now I've got this partial positive and this partial negative, and so I'm going to get an interaction between the negative and the positive here, and this would be a dipole-dipole force, right, between the two molecules. So the difference between this and the van der Waals is that this one is not going to readily dissipate due to the movement of electrons between the hydrogen and the chlorine. The chlorine will always have the lion's share or the bulk of the electron activity towards itself, and so we don't expect that partial negative or that excess electron property to dissipate from the chlorine's end relative to the hydrogen's end. And so that kind of fixes these intermolecular forces in place more permanently in comparison to the van der Waals forces, which are fleeting. They kind of just come and go rapidly as they renew and dissipate over and over again. Okay, so that's dipole-dipole. Now, I'm going to be up front and say I do not like the name here, okay? It, it is what it is, and I understand why they gave it this name. Um, but the word bonding in particular I don't like because bonds, again, are an intramolecular force, not an intermolecular force. So then we start talking about hydrogen bonding or H-bonding, and I feel like it can be very confusing for students um, that are first learning this because you just start off by telling them, you know, intermolecular forces are not bonds. They are interactions between molecules due to differences in electron activity or electronegativity. And then right after that on the list, you have something and you say, OK, here's hydrogen bonding. It's like that's very confusing. But anyway, I'm not going to continue to rant on that. So hydrogen bonding, okay? Hydrogen bonding is going to be a very subset uh, select number of bonds. And it's going to be if you've got a hydrogen fluorine bond, if you have a hydrogen oxygen bond, and if you have a hydrogen and nitrogen bond. Okay, so these are really the strongest of the dipoles that we deal with. So... If you look above, when we were talking about HCl, right, there's still a separation of hydrogen and chlorine in terms of electronegativity. But if you look at the essentially three most electronegative elements on the chart uh, that are going to give the biggest separation in charge with hydrogen, it's these. It's fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay, Chlorine gets kind of close in terms of debatability. 
Um, but generally, these three are the ones that are considered accepted or the gold standard for hydrogen bonding. And so certain compounds, and water is included in this because it has O and H, right, are going to be able to align themselves with another form of that same molecule. And the partial negatives and the partial positives, it's again, it's just a dipole interaction but it's the strongest of the bunch. So this is really partially negative. This is really partially positive. So that H bonding that you get in effect is going to be far stronger than your regular just dipole dipole interaction. Hydrogen bonding is the you know one of the strongest if not the strongest of the dipole dipoles that you have there. So um, this becomes important. Uh, all of these are important, but this in particular if you get into biochemistry and you start talking about, you know, amino acids and proteins and all sorts of things. There's lots of different, van der Waals becomes important, uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions between the, the different components. But hydrogen bonding is very important when you get into biochemistry, especially when you start talking about nucleic acids. Uh, you want to talk about DNA, why A pairs with T and why C pairs with G, hydrogen bonding. It's because they have hydrogen bonding partners that keep that double helix together through intermolecular forces. Okay, so very important. And then the last one here to wrap up is ion dipole. So this one we tend not to see quite as often when there's examples coming up in the classroom and stuff. Not to say that it doesn't happen. It certainly does. Uh, but this is where you're going to have something that has a formal ion and then that's going to coordinate itself or create a dipole with... Um, something that would be partial okay so you can have ion ion where it's like an ionic bond essentially uh, but ion dipole is the idea that let's say that i take uh, sodium chloride right and it's aqueous so i'm dumping this salt into water to get aqueous sodium and then aqueous chloride okay so just like this now the thing that you have to realize here is that these once they have kind of separated out in solution here they have a formal charge meaning they're not that that delta sign that i keep writing which is this right here right partial positive or partial negative these are not partial these are full-on regular formal charges of plus one and minus one for the sodium and the chlorine so what happens well if this is aqueous it's going to be in the presence of water and so water we know already has this very strong separation here where you get partial positive for the hydrogens and partial negative for the oxygens if i have a full positive and not a partial positive then all the more so will there be an attraction or an interaction between that sodium or that cation with that partial negative oxygen okay and i would expect this for multiple waters right so another one could come up here and could coordinate itself down like this right and that would be partial negative as well so you would expect the opposite here so for the chlorine if you've got uh water right it would be one of the hydrogens that really kind of assembles itself or puts itself there so the partial positive there would happily interact with the formal negative charge the chlorine's got extra electrons there okay so this is ion dipole interactions Strongest of the bunch, very, very strong to break apart because now we're not even dealing with um, dipoles necessarily all around. We're dealing with ions that are mixing with the dipoles and ions have formal charges. That's very different than when you're just talking about partial positives and partial negatives. So anyway, those are the four. It's van der Waals forces, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding which is really the strongest of the dipole dipole situations and ion dipole those are your intermolecular forces so i hope you found this lecture useful if you subscribe you'll stay up to date with all the content we release throughout the school year as you're going through your studies it's also just a good reference channel okay head on over to chemcomplete.com if you go to chemcomplete.com and you sign up it's completely free we don't spam or email you there's lots of free resources that are available there in order to help you get started with stuff and if you want to support the channel we've got guides walkthrough guides on more difficult concepts that you may come across in general chemistry and organic chemistry like gas chromatography lab report writing or how to solve for unknown structures using nmr ir and mass spec 
things of that nature. So go on over there and check us out at chemcomplete.com. I'm going to wrap up the video here because it's getting on close to 20 minutes by the time I'm finishing this. So I will see everybody in the next lecture. Take care.